Welcome to Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town from the world's number one poker community. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Struzinski. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number 97 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is a true legend of the game. She was one of the OG women in the poker world. She's amassed over $6.6 million in live tournament earnings over her nearly 30-year career, which includes a WSOP bracelet, several WPT final tables, and she was the first woman ever to win a million dollars in a tournament at the now legendary Party Poker Million in 2002. This past summer, she was a first-time nominee for the Poker Hall of Fame, and she's already a long-standing member of the Women in Poker Hall of Fame. Today, we're going to get to know her a little better. It's an honor to welcome Kathy Lieber to the Cards Chat Podcast. Thank you. How are you doing, Kathy? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, true to your reputation, after 30 years, you're still grinding. You're coming to me after another day full of poker tournaments, right? Yeah, I was playing some online. Uh, I was thinking about going to WPT Legends. But didn't wound up going out. Didn't didn't make it there. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's kind of kind of awesome that uh, you know you're still so into the game, loving it after all these years. But you know we'll get to that eventually. I just uh, I guess best to start out from the beginning. Um, and also before before we do that, one little thing I've noticed. You know, at least from the research I've done, you haven't really done any really super lengthy hour long interviews, or at least I wasn't able to find them. So just want to thank you so much for, for being with us today to, to sort of share your story uh, of your career. That's pretty cool. Sure. Cool. So um, what is sort of your first poker memory and what is it about poker that initially attracted you? Like, Hey, I, I want to do more of this. Uh, well, I started playing a little bit when I was a kid, nickel dime quarter at the kitchen table with family and friends. But I always enjoyed it. I always liked games. I always liked playing games, and I liked making money. So it seemed like a a pretty good game. They could actually make money and and, and enjoy the game. So uh, yeah, I, I I just you know as as a kid, I just enjoyed all sorts of games and poker especially uh, because the yeah the winning you could actually see yourself winning and keep results and then make some money. So uh, and after that. Um, I wound up uh, going to Vegas a couple times and uh, finding the poker rooms there and just sat down and enjoyed playing. So that was kind of my first uh, foray into the poker world. That's pretty just cool. Well, so as, as a youngster already making money, I'm trying to think, you know, yourself surrounded by family and friends. So, you know, I get this was a big thing or, you know, was it like a Thanksgiving game or regularly they were also into game playing and cards specifically? Uh, we didn't play a ton. Uh, I always enjoyed playing. I actually think I went out and bought a book when I was, uh, still, you know, when I was, uh, you know, just playing the home games, kind of oh, wow. trying to learn how to, you know, learning a little bit about it and kind of keeping my, my results in the cover of the, inside the cover of the book saying, you know, so, uh, I was always kind of competitive and always enjoyed games. So I think it was one of my favorites from early on, just playing at the kitchen table. I don't know. I don't think we did it that often, but it was always something I enjoyed doing. That's super cool. Um, and, you know, like obviously, like I said, you're still going today after all these years, after that initial attraction to the game, after that, oh, just going to Vegas a couple of times. You know, just I, I you know, I want to talk about this past summer because still, like, you know, you're still recording results uh, and, and, you know, obviously some big results. But just, you know, till we understand uh, as an audience how it went from someone who loved the game and, you know, got into it from home games to, you know, the legendary Kathy Lieber. At what point did you sort of decide this is sort of the lifestyle for me? I want to pursue this as a profession. Uh, well, when I, I graduated from college, and I took a job at Dun & Bradstreet as a business analyst. Mm. And I worked there for about a year. And I didn't really love the job. And I really didn't see myself... Uh, wanting to be in that job for a long period of time. So I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was thinking about maybe going to law school. I really didn't know, uh, you know, you know. so I, I just decided to leave the job without really having a direction and uh, wound up going to uh, just, just decided to travel, went to California at first, and then I wound up going to Colorado and decided, hey, I could live in Colorado and just check it out and, you know, go skiing in the mountains and just, you know, just a change, just decided for a change right. without really having a game plan or any, real idea of what I was going to do, you know, and it was a big switch, 
you know, because I was thinking I was going to be in the business world. And, you know, I was always into like stock market and business and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, finance. But uh, the job I had didn't really seem to be, you know, it just wasn't fun, really. Hmm. So I went to Colorado and um, I didn't really have a plan, but they had opened up uh, five dollar limit casinos. Uh -huh, right. So I just started going up there. And before I knew it, I was kind of like looking at the game, didn't really know much about I hadn't really played much, you know, I played a little bit when I was a kid, but it was all new. So uh, I saw they had $5 a little bit poker games, started sitting down and just playing. Is this uh, Blackhawk? Yeah, Central City and Blackhawk. Central yep. City, right, right. Oh, wow. That, and that's how it began. Crazy. Unbelievable. And at the time you were thinking, I could make a living from this, or it's just like, you know, bide your time until you find the new path? No, I mean, at, at the first, I really didn't think about making a living at it i just thought it was something fun to do and mm -hmm. you know some, you know i actually did go to the gambler's bookstore in colorado also uh -huh. i picked up a couple of books on poker as well because you know i didn't really feel like i knew what i was doing i was just trying to i was just learning pretty much you know right. i mean those nickel dime quarter games didn't really give me a <laughs> a solid grasp of the game to be <laughs> you know super competitive at it sure. even though i you know i probably held my own in those games back then right but uh, yeah so i just started playing a little bit and i could actually the game that i sat down in was the only game they had running at the time was seven cards study eight or better. There you go. And I, really did, and I didn't have a lot of experience and, you know, we, you know, so, uh, you know, at first I wasn't doing that well. And then I started talking to a couple people in the game and thinking about the game a little bit more and started having a little bit more success, but it wasn't, uh, it certainly wasn't like I was a poker master or anything like that, but sure. I just started kept playing and just, uh, you know, and I, you know, eventually I met a couple people in the game and we would talk poker and they would help me and give me some tips and stuff. And that, that helped. Right. And uh, before I knew it, I was playing home games and playing the casino more and more. And uh, yeah, I was actually making some money. It wasn't making a fortune, but I was enjoying it. Huh. Unbelievable. That's very cool. It's funny. It reminds me of uh, some great advice that uh, one of my mentors once told me. She's like, keep doing what you're doing and good things will happen. And it seems sort of that that was your road. <laughs> to, to, you know, start yeah, when I, was, when I was at the job and I wasn't happy and I was thinking about quitting, you know, right. I was thinking it would be kind of silly just to quit without really having a plan or another job. Uh -huh. But then my mom was like, do what you love. The money will follow. She just, the book had just come out and she was, you know, she encouraged me. She didn't know I was going to be a poker player. You know, right. That probably made her a little nervous actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, sort of. I was playing just the home games, and I was doing okay, but I didn't know if I could make a living just playing like, you know, there was a five dollar limit games, and then they had like four eight home games and ten twenty once in a while. Sure. And yeah, I mean, you're not going to make a fortune doing that. Uh, but you know, I was like, wow, can I really do this and you know and survive? And uh, you know, I probably could have. But uh, then they told uh, a friend, a couple of friends said that told me about this tournament going on in Vegas uh -huh. at the Gold Coast in 1994. I've been playing home games for a couple of years. Yep. And they were encouraging me to go. And I was like, I don't know, you know, I didn't know anything about tournaments or anything. So again, I went out, bought a book on tournaments and went uh -huh. out there and, uh, and it went really well. Amazing. Well, I definitely have some questions, uh, about the gold coast. I've stayed there a number of times, uh, but we will get, we will get to that. So, um, that's very, very cool. Again, you know, it's the humble roots, uh, you know, to a legend via learning yeah, and, and slowly growing and then the books, it's a, it's a really cool, uh, sort of poker origin story. I love it. Um, but again, you know, like I said, it's not, uh, you know, something that's, you know, old and, and, and faded away. You're still crushing. You got eight WSOP caches this past summer. And uh, you had a major deep run in the seniors event. You finished fifth place uh, in a field of almost 7,200 entries for a $186,000 score. Your, your largest score actually for about 13 years or so. Um, what can you tell us about uh, this latest deep run of yours? Well, the, the seniors are more fun to play with, honestly. It's a, it's a really good tournament, and uh, it's, a, it's a whole different kind of tournament. And I was having fun. I was just talking a lot and probably too much sometimes, but I was just enjoying being there. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, and, it was a, and I, I just uh, managed to, to uh, you know, play against the players that, uh, you know, they were having fun and, you know, just kind of, you know, kind of feeling them out as opposed to, you know, these kids that are always tanking and stuff like that. We were uh -huh. just kind of, I was just. Go, you know, playing the old, old school, old style, just kind of uh -huh. enjoying myself and playing the players and just feeling it out. And uh, I had, you know, I started, you know, running pretty good and reading the players pretty well. And uh, that, that was fun. Sure. I mean, as someone who's, 
obviously made plenty of deep runs, uh, won a bracelet, won your fair share of tournaments. Was there a point, you know, you know, going through the minefield of 7,200 people, you know, you ended up finishing fifth, but was there a point where you maybe said to yourself, okay, this is mine, and, you know, perhaps it was just a, a couple bad beats away from the winner's circle? Uh, not really. I mean, you know, I, I ran really well for, uh, I think it was the, the day before the final table. I w- and, and so for a little while, I was catching a lot of big hands, and the players were didn't expect, you know, I was raising and re-raising a lot. They're like, you can't have a hand every time. And I was <laughs> catching a lot of big hands. I caught aces quite a few times, and, uh-huh. you know, so I was getting paid off in spots. And uh, and that was a lot of fun, just running really, really good uh, for a while there. And I had actually been a short stack for a while right before the bu- right before the money bubble mm. and uh, and and late uh, on one of the days. But then, but then, uh, yeah, I managed to survive and, and run really well. And then when we got down to the final five, we ended for the day. So I was coming, uh, we came, decided to come back the next day for the final five, and I felt pretty good going into the final table. Uh, you know, I didn't feel like it was uh, a lock or anything like that, but I felt like I had a good chance. And then everything at, at the final table, I ran really, really poorly, mm. which, uh, you know, it happens. Sure. It, it's funny because, like, you know, I, I love that you say it sort of kind of matter of factly because obviously you've just got, you know, the experience to back that up. You know, it does happen. But, you know, to, to lots of us that they, that may be our one chance, it's uh, obviously somewhat disappointing. But I guess you recognize that sometimes the cards, even if they've gone your way for a couple of days straight, you know, it may not that third day, and that's kind of critical to end up winning. Totally get it. Um, well, from one six-figure score to your first uh, six-figure score, uh, you know, looking back at your Hendon mob caches, uh, we start to you know see that the first ones came uh, in the in the ninety in 1997. Actually, the first WSOP cash uh, you finished in. I'm just looking at my records here. Okay, 18th place. In a three thousand dollar pot limit hold'em event, and then you had a runner-up finish in a three thousand no limit uh, hold'em event for one hundred twenty-three thousand uh, dollars. That was your first six-figure six-figure score. So you know, talking you know twenty-five years basically, uh, you know, bookending these six-figure scores. One that we just talked about, and one uh, you know back in the no limit hold'em event in WSOP. Um, you know, the money's a little bit different, obviously, you know, it's uh, worth a little more with inflation, these, uh, with, with a little more back then, uh, you know, with inflation these days. But, you know, playing the WSOP, you know, last year, you know, the, the, this past one for the first time on the strip, uh, you know, in Bally's Paris versus back in 1997, uh, you know, in, in Binion's Horseshoe over there. Lots of things have changed. Obviously, the, the Rio uh, was was in between those experiences. You know, you've been a staple at the WSOP all of these years. In what way, besides sort of like those superficial things that I mentioned, you know, the venue, in what way has the WSOP changed as far as your own personal experience each year? Well, I mean, it's changed a lot. And the venue is a lot different, obviously. And Mm -hmm. uh, there's tons more people than there used to be. You know, it's huge fields and, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, and waiting in the hallways and stuff like that. That's a lot different. You know, in the old days, you just kind of went to your table and, you know, it was on the Fremont Street out there. You on your break, you walked around that side and, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it was just a much smaller group of people. And the prizes, you know, the, the prize pools and the was was much was was not as was not as big. The, the player fields were obviously much smaller. Right. And uh, it just felt uh, it felt a little different. I mean, you knew a lot of the players and you know, a lot of the same players and uh, you were playing with a lot of the world champions and a lot of the successful players uh you know it was a pretty small group really you know compared to now where there's just so many more uh of all types and you don't even know half the players that you see you know so um you know it's just it's grown so much and it's gotten so much bigger than it was back then and do you miss that a little bit yeah um uh, yeah i mean you know the horseshoe had uh you know it was kind of cool and it was kind of you know it was I don't know. It just it felt a little bit different because it mm-hmm. was like it did feel more prestigious in a way back then. It felt like more mm-hmm. special in a way, mm-hmm. you know. Just uh, you know that it just. Uh, but I mean, it was new also, you know. And I would go in there and I'd see, you know, Ted Forrest and Mike Sexton and you know all these World Series champions and be like, oh wow, you know. I mean, so yeah, it just kind of felt like you know, oh, this is something that I really would be it would really really cool to to get to to, to win this and stuff like that. And I guess. You know, I guess there's less of that now because, 
I don't know, just there was brochures and you know, oh, and you know, sure. it just it felt like you know, it, I don't know, it was just a little bit different. It was more, it was it was it was kind of felt like it was more of um, yeah, there was more promotion about it in a way back then. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, now you know, you you still see the results and stuff like that, and it's right. and it's still very prestigious. But it just it was it, it was a lot different back then. Hmm. So interesting. I wish I I wish I could have been a fly on the wall back when just to sort of just to sort of see it. Like, that sounds just very cool and nostalgic. Anyone who's into poker history, you know, you've seen like the old tapes of the World Series of Poker, and you've seen all you know folks, some folks who are still around, uh, you know, and still playing now. You know, looking you know 25, 30 years younger. Also, it's like oh wow, they've they've definitely been you know playing for quite a while. Uh, but I will say, you know, th- those home game skills honed in Colorado and, and dare I even suggest, you know, the way you were playing 25 years ago, I don't know that that would get you to the winner's circle today. Clearly you've upped your game and, you know, improved. Um, in what way over the years have you honed your craft? Uh, has it just been books or, you know, any other sort of training or anything like that that you've done? Um, You know, for the most part, it, when, when I first started playing, I was reading books and talking to players and mm-hmm. trying to, you know, and trying to think about the game and study the game. Uh, but after playing for so long, I just started, you know, I, I just was mostly playing and not doing a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the game did change a lot. And, you know, when the, you know, when the internet poker started becoming more prominent and a lot of these young, young internet kind of kids that were getting training online and stuff came about, you know, at first I didn't really, um, you know, know what they were doing or how they were playing and, you know, how to, how to adjust to that. Uh, it was a lot different style. And it kind of did confuse me because it was just so different than what I was used to. Right. Um, but I never, I mean, for the most, I mean, I did look at a little bit of training here and there and, you know, some of those kind of stuff. But for the most part, I was just playing mm-hmm. and kind of trying to figure it out rather than doing a lot of, you know, studying and a lot of GTO. You know, I certainly did read books back in the old days, but uh, I'm certainly not somebody that's done a lot of, um, a lot of training or studying, you know, like, like these kids do these days. Sure. No, it's an entirely fair. I mean, you got the the pedigree and the experience, uh, you know, to to be able to figure things out uh, as you always have. So that, that's pretty cool. But it's also known, uh, you know, almost poker one hundred and one in a way is like you know the first lesson is game selection is very important. So I'm wondering, you know, obviously someone uh, who plays all the games, you know, you mentioned already uh, stud eight or better. Uh, obviously, uh, no limit hold'em. Uh, did you sort of shift your focus a little bit to perhaps the games that haven't been as solved, the non holding games? And, you know, maybe there's something that's not holding that you particularly enjoy more. Is, is that the case? Uh, no, actually, when I first started playing, I would play whatever tournament there was. You know, I, oh. I had some success early on and whatever, and I would go to a tournament and whatever game they was playing, I would just play, play whatever tournament they had that day. Hmm. So I was playing a lot of limit games. Uh, when I started, and at first I was mostly a limit player, and then once I discovered no limit, I really enjoyed it better, and you know was mostly playing no limit, and kind of lost my interest in a lot of the limit games. Hmm. So over the years, I've played mostly no limit hold'em. You know, it's still kind of fun once in a while to play a different game, but I just don't play it that that often anymore. So I don't feel as 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 practiced or as or as you know I don't feel as competitive in those games as I maybe it was in the beginning. You know, in the old days, nobody knew how to play Omaha Ada better. Right. You know, and it was very, you know, it wasn't, it really wasn't a big game. And now, you know, and now it's a lot more people play it, but, you know, I kind of just switched to mostly no limit because it's the big, it's the bigger fields and the bigger money. Mm-hmm. And it just, you know, I just got used to playing more no limit. So the limit game sort of took a, a back seat. Right. Oh, it's interesting. You mentioned, uh, you know, it's the bigger money and obviously, uh, you know, that is the, you know, just like playing a video game in a sense, you want the highest score, you want to win the most money. That's the hallmark of any poker pro. Do the titles mean anything to you? You know, the, the bracelets, the accolades, the trophies, anything like that? Or is it genuinely, even after all these years, still the money that uh, motivates you the most? Uh, it's always nice to win, obviously. You know, titles and bracelets and rings mm-hmm. and all that stuff. It is a, it is a motivator. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's ever something that I really focused on that much. I think I was always kind of like, oh, I'll go, I'll play, I'll try to play my best. I'll try to make as much money as possible. And if I win, great. But I wasn't really so much focused on, oh, I need a bracelet or I need a ring or something like that. Mm. Uh, in fact, a lot of my style back in the old days was that I'd make a final table and I would play tighter than average. And I found myself getting heads up a lot with the short stack because, you know, I'd mm. let the other people knock themselves out. And I was like, oh, all I have to do is survive right. and I can move up in money. And when I get heads up, 
you know, now I can play and gamble and, you know, and try to get lucky. So right. that actually was a very successful strategy because I would often find myself heads up, but I often find my, I, I often was getting second place also because I was usually kind of in survival mode more than, you know, I wasn't the one knocking everybody out. Usually I was letting them knock each other out and kind of right. just surviving. That's interesting. Well, obviously, you're talking about laddering up, and that's still something that, to a degree, some people try to do today, looking at the payouts, you know, how much more can I make? Um, well, clearly, you said that that you did that in the old days, and I guess perhaps the aggression factor uh, has increased uh, in general in players over the years. Um, what it, When did you sort of realize, okay, this is not working anymore, I need to ramp it up, or I need to change things? At what point did that happen? Well, I don't even think I don't think that I really did change it that much. Uh, mm. You know, I do I do think that uh, at the final table, you know, uh, a solid kind of waiting it out strategy makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to survive. Uh, but it's probably not the best strategy for actually winning the tournament. Uh -huh. You know, the, the, you know, if you if you go in there playing aggressively, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you can bully the people that are trying to play solid and waiting for the pay jumps, and you can get accumulate a lot of chips that way, and it gives you a better chance to actually win the tournament. Right. Uh, but the pay jumps are significant and it might not be the best strategy to go in there being aggressive and, you know, putting your, a lot of chips at risk because, you know, you, 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 you have a better chance to win, but you also have a better chance of being eliminated early. Sure. So, uh, I don't know that I've really changed that much. I mean, you know, at the seniors final table, um, you know, I was aware of the, the pretty big pay jumps and I did play a little bit more conservatively, um, than I might have if I was just trying to win the win the bracelet. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work out, <laughs> you know. It didn't work out. But I'm, you know, I I, I might have I might have you know if I was just trying to go for the win, I might have played a little more aggressively and just and gambled a little bit more. Uh, but I was trying to kind of pick my spots and wait and be patient. Right. Um, so I think I, I mean overall I think I still have a similar style to 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 to, to the way I played back then. But uh, yeah, I mean obviously. Uh, you know, it would be you know, winning a bracelet is still, you know, it's still significant and important. I would like to do that. So, you know, you have to, you have to kind of decide, you know, what, what makes the most sense. Right. But, uh, I do think, you know, I mean, the money jumps are very significant. So just saying, oh, I don't care about that. And I'm just going to go for it. Uh, you know, that is, um, not necessarily what I, you know, what I think is the best way to approach it. For sure. And, and this is the type of topic, and you, know, you hear it discussed, you know, quite a lot in, in, in pro circles as well. Talk about the money jumps, you know, take, let's say, you know, a, a typical, you know, World Series. If, well, obviously, the main event, you look at, you know, the, the, the huge money jumps of the final table, and sometimes you see on TV, okay, you know, oh, so-and-so made a, a risky play, and the difference between, you know, whatever, fifth place and fourth place is, you know, a million dollars or more. Again, that's an extreme example, but when you take that out of context and you think how much longer is it going to take that person to earn one million dollars again in poker in tournaments that's a long time so sometimes money jumps really can make a big difference uh and it's important to you know focus on those spots um you know we talked about um you know how your experience in poker has evolved over the years just you know, at the World Series and, and you know, your memories from there. Uh, obviously, you know, you remain, uh, you know, you already were in the beginning and remain a very prominent woman uh, in the game. And you've seen a lot, you know, you've gone through the hallways for all these years. Um, from your perspective, you know, what can you sort of tell us about, I guess, the evolution of women in the game over the last 20, 25 years? When I first started playing the tournament circuit, there was very few women that were playing very many tournaments. You know, if you would go to, you know, if you were, you know, usually there'd be a few women that were local that would be playing in that tournament, but there wasn't very many women that were traveling around and playing a lot of the big tournaments. It was very rare. In fact, I was probably one of the very few that was actually traveling and playing tournaments in different locations. You know, I think uh, even, even Marsha Wagner and Barbara Enright, who were very successful back in those days, sure. they weren't doing as much traveling either. I mean, they were playing you know, mostly in California and the, and Vegas, you know, uh, they weren't necessarily going to every little tournament that was all around, you know, every place. Um, so yeah, that was, that. I, I really, there wasn't very many women playing at all. And, uh, I don't think that it was, I don't, you know, I, I don't think there was as many avenues for women to learn and get into the game. Mm -hmm. Whereas now with, with, when online came about a lot more women started playing online and getting a lot more comfortable playing. And, you know, a lot of them were, were learning, um, you know, with, with those, you know, with the, with the guys at that point and getting more comfortable and doing the forums and the studying and, and that kind of thing. And obviously when Vanessa Selps came along, sure. uh, sure. she was very successful and, 
I think that uh, she had some she had some training sites and some and did some coaching and things like that. And I think a lot of women uh, saw that she was you know what she was doing and decided to to follow in her footsteps and you know doing the more training and you know studying the game and mm-hmm. being more comfortable playing against you know the open fields and you know so it became over the years obviously a lot more women started playing and a lot more women started being more competitive and successful. Sure, um, you know, and it's funny you know, like not to be stereotypical you know it's like how many poker interviews take place and when you have a, a woman on one side it's almost expected that you would ask questions oh what's it like to be a woman but just to sort of give it context for the listeners and also for yourself Kathy just you know I know what it's like in a way to, to sort of be on the other side of that when I was studying college I studied uh, for an English linguistics degree and I was one of three men in uh, a major which was obviously predominantly women you know just every single day every single class it was me and either one or two other guys and you know a room full of women and that was okay it was totally natural for me because okay sure it's you know a little bit like okay, well, we're all the guys i guess they're studying other things but over time you just sort of get used to it and i loved what i was doing and loving you know english linguistics so it just sort of felt okay so that's sort of the context so i'm wondering from your standpoint when you started you said there were barely any women around what was it what did it feel like for you to sort of be thrust into a world where there are no other you know or very very few other women you know i didn't really think about it that much i was enjoying the game and i was mm-hmm. having some success and i wasn't really thinking about it too much it would have been nice to have other women in the game to talk mm-hmm. to and, and be friends with and stuff. And, uh, but it just, it really, I really didn't think about it that much. You know, mm. for the most part, uh, I just felt like I was just one of the, you know, one of the players and uh-huh. it didn't matter. You know, I wasn't really, it didn't, I wasn't, I didn't feel any different or feel like I should be treated any differently. I mean, you want to be treated with respect. And of for the course. most part, people did, you know, occasionally there would be, you know, a guy that was out of line or something like that. But, uh, you know, I was just, I was just there to play the game. I wasn't there to, make friends or socialize or anything, right. you know, back then I was just enjoying the game and that aspect of it and wasn't really thinking about it in terms of, you know, socializing or making friends, you know, I've become more social actually, you know, in the, now that I was back then, because uh-huh. then I was just, it was all about the game back then. And now that I've had a lot more experience, you know, I like to, you know, I am more, much more likely to have a conversation at the table now than I was back then. That's great. Well, I, I can tell you already at this point, I've, I've very much been enjoying this conversation. And, you know, should it work out that, you know, that both of us enter the same tournament, I hope I get, uh, you know, I know I'd be outclassed, outplayed, and out everything, but I'm, I'm sure I'd enjoy a conversation with you at the table as well. Um, you know, uh, you've been around, again, we, we, we've said, you know, for a, a lengthy career. Uh, and like you said, from the time when there weren't many women in the game and now, you know, still, uh, and a minority of players, but many more women are, are now playing. And, you know, it's so nice that there is something called the Women in Poker Hall of Fame. And you were recognized as one of the first inductees uh, back in 2010. Uh, what did that recognition mean to you at the time? Yeah, like I said, there really was very few women that were playing on a regular basis. And really at that time, there was not very many women that were playing and, and had much, a lot of success. So I think that it kind of just, um, it showed women that there are successful women and, you know, in poker and recognize them and, and said to the, you know, said to other women that, Hey, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're competitive here and, uh, you know, and you can, you know, so it, I think that it just kind of was not, you know, it was nice to show the women that there are successful women and, uh, you know, and, you know, as more and more women became, you know, be, started to play, you know, a lot of, there was a lot more successful women. And I think that, you know, it's, it's nice to know. I think the women do feel like, you know, if other women have done it, it's easier for them to to, 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 to try it and be more competitive. You know, when I first started playing, there were so few women that most, that most women probably wouldn't even think to do it. And now that there are so many successful women, I think women feel a lot more comfortable playing. You know, I have a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, you know, I, you know, I never thought about playing. And then I saw, you know, you and other, other women being successful and that made me want to play and give it a shot. And how did that make you feel when those when those sorts of things happen? Yeah, I mean it's nice it, it's nice to know that people um, you know that women became more interested in the game because other women were playing. You know, mm-hmm. I guess if it was all men, they they might not have had the same interest in it. Right. So for better or for worse, you know, uh, it's you know I think that women should feel like they can compete. You know, and 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 then play if they want to. And it's a you know it was always for me it, it was enjoyable, but I enjoyed the com- the competition. But I was. I was trying to make money and I was trying to enjoy the competition 
you know, but I just, I love the game and I, you know, I think that women should feel like they can compete. Excellent. That's, that's very cool. Does playing uh, in a ladies event feel a little different to you or is it still, oh, I'm just here to play the game. It doesn't really matter who's around the table. It is different. You know, uh, usually there's a lot more beginners in the ladies event and it mm. is generally more sociable and fun and friendly, you know, and, uh, and I enjoy that. Uh, it does feel like it's, you know, it does feel like, uh, kind of going back in time a little bit because yeah. most of the women there are not professional players. You know, they're, they're just, you know, kind of enjoying it and playing, you know, and they haven't had a lot of experience. So it, it does, you know, it, it, you know, but some of them are very serious also, you know, they, they're really trying to, to be successful and to play well. Uh, in fact, I think, I think in the old days, it was more of a social event. And now a lot, a lot, there's a lot more women that are doing it more competitively. You sure. know? So, but I enjoy the ladies events. You know, I think that it is kind of a friendlier, funner environment. Nice. Well, that's cool. Well, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, you being a, an inductee, a member of the Women in Poker Hall of Fame. And, you know, for the first time uh, this coming December, uh, they're going to be having first time in four years, actually, uh, a new class of inductees. Uh, who would you like to see sort of get in as someone who, you know, is, you know, currently making an impact? I think one of the criteria is uh, has to be minimum 35 years old, but has been, uh or has been already, you know, 10 years of, you know, playing and making an impact or on the industry side, uh, making an impact. Is there anyone you kind of have your eye on as like this person is deserving in your eyes? I mean, like I said, there's a lot of competitive women and a lot of really good women players these days. There haven't been a ton that have been around for, you know, 10 plus years. Uh, you know, it's still, a lot of them are still fairly young, obviously, like, uh, like Lonnie Harwood and, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, and, uh, you know, so there's quite a few uh, young uh, women players, but sure. uh, Kristen Bicknell, I guess, has been around for quite a while, and she's had a lot of success. Obviously, she's kind of a, a fairly newcomer, but still been around a long time. Sure. Uh, sure. And of course, Vanessa Selps, obviously, kind of, you know, she changed the game when she came on the scene and was so successful. And even though she's uh, not currently playing, obviously, uh, she's very deserving, and uh, you know, one of the, you know, obviously, the most successful women player of all time. And uh, she she really did kind of, uh, you know give people a different different viewpoint of women in poker you know sure i'm curious actually obviously uh you know because you mentioned uh vanessa subs like she said she's you know involved in other pursuits at the moment when she burst on the scene uh to you and started recording these massive results deep finishes you know getting her three bracelets as well you as someone who'd kind of you know been grinding and and, and doing the poker thing for quite a while what did her arrival on the scene sort of, you know, did it make any sort of impact for you or was it just sort of like, oh, any other player? Was was there any sort of, uh, oh, uh, got to gotta watch out for this one? Was, was there something like that? Uh, I mean, I actually made a final table with her pretty early on at uh -huh. Foxwood. Uh, and, uh, you know, she reminded me a little bit of myself, you know, very competitive and stuff like that. But she was kind of... Uh, uh, she, she she was kind of making some comments and things like that, and I was a little bit surprised at some of the things she said. Like you know, one hand I I bought a we play we're playing three handed, and I want to I want to be pot. She raised the other guy raised. I think I wound up coming in the hand, you know, and uh -huh. I wound up winning the pot with like East Jack, and she was like, oh East Jack, you know. She was like, oh well, if I don't get that, I would have I would have four bed or something like that, you know. You know, I don't remember exactly the conversation, but uh -huh. she was, I was like I was like you had better than that. She was like, no, but I could have gotten you to fold, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, I mean, she was, you know, but, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I think it was, I, I think it's pretty cool that uh, she, that she made such an impact and that she was so successful and she was obviously very smart, you know, and, you know, it, it kind of, like I said, it kind of reminded me of V in terms of the, you know, how competitive she was and how, you know, how serious she was about the game. And um, yeah, I do think that it made uh, a big impact on a lot of women to see that. And, uh, you know, obviously Maria Ho has been around a long time too. Sure. And I don't know if she's in the women hall of fame, but, uh, you know, she's obviously someone that's had a lot of success and, and, uh, you know, especially, uh, in, in all sorts of games, you know? Sure. So, sure. And she was actually, uh, in the last class of inductees, I believe it was her and Lupe Soto who were inducted okay. in, in 2018. Yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah. Um, well from one, uh, poker hall of fame to another, the, the, uh, poker hall of fame, uh, which is, you know, both men and women, uh, you are on the list of nominees for the first time, which is, uh, you know, already itself, uh, an honor. It's a very cool thing. There are just three female members. Uh, you've already mentioned, uh, Barbara Enright, uh, and of course, Linda Johnson, uh, and Jennifer Harmon, three women who are in the poker hall of fame. I think, 
uh, I don't know, I think there are about 60, 61 uh, members altogether, uh, about half of whom are, are currently living. Um, there's a lot that can be said about uh, the induction process. It's something that a lot of a lot of us in poker media have been, you know, talking about debating and always comes up, uh, you know, once a year during the World Series. Oh, who should get inducted? How many? All that other sort of stuff. Um, the nomination itself, though, what does that mean to you? And was it ever or has it been a goal of yours to, oh, I, I belong in there I, or I, I really, really want to get in there? Is, is that a thing for you? You know, I never really thought about it a lot because I, I, mean, I never really, you know, tried to uh, encourage anybody to vote for me or anything like that because, you know, there's just so many great players. You know, there's just so many great players, and uh, it's just it's just so competitive. And to and to be on a you know to to get in is just so hard because there's just you know it's so competitive. Only one a year now, you know. Uh, so I didn't really put it on a on a list or really think about it that much because mm -hmm. I, I didn't really expect it to be honest. Um, you know, there's just so many successful players that have had such great records over so many years that you know to get in is is such a long shot for anybody. And, uh, you know, a lot of great players are never going to get in, you know, so, you know, with only one a year and only 60 in, you know, it's uh, so uh, but it's 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 definitely an honor to be uh, recognized and to have people think that I I deserve to be on that list. You know, that's that's very nice. And, um, you know, I don't think that I have the most uh, the best results out of all the people that are nominated or that could possibly get in. Uh, have been around a long time, and uh, you know, I mean, I think it is um, it is something that I would consider, uh, you know, very uh, prestigious to get in. Sure. Uh, but you know, I don't think there's going to be that. You know, I, I don't think there's going to be that many women in it, just because you know, it's just there's just so many people that uh, that are deserving, and it's just you know, so um, yeah, it's sure. very, it's so yeah. So I mean. Well, it's interesting to get your thoughts on that. You know, like again, I'm, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have a vote or anything like that, and you know, I don't need to, you know, confirm anything. But what I can say is, if you look at, you know, the criteria that are currently had, you know, uh, of what one needs as a player to get in, I think uh, kind of like the most important, and of course, uh, you know, open to interpretation, you know, one way or another, you know, has stood the test of time. And it's not okay; has just been playing. But the fact is you know, continually recording results, getting final tables, getting wins, still making money that just in general in life, you know, you look at a, you know, a basketball player, you look at a football player, any other game, a chess player, even, you know, it's not easy to continue. You know, like you always say someone has their prime and then, you know, it's all downhill from there, but for poker players, if they can manage for 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, all that stuff, you look at Doyle Brunson, you know, at 88 years old, still playing the highest stakes, you know, to stand the test of time is really a great criteria, uh, criterion uh, to to sort of measure by which is someone worthy of the Hall of Fame. And just to be on that nominees list uh, is, is pretty awesome. So, you know, good for you. And I do wish you the best of luck, uh, you know, uh, in future, uh, you know, hopefully polls, whatever it is that the process is, uh, perhaps uh, you may you may be enshrined someday. Um Kathy, you said, uh, you know, I don't have the best uh, results, whatever it is, but we got to discuss one one incredible result. I, mean, I, I think you've had, you know, people would die for your resume. You look at your hand in my like, oh, wow, that'd be amazing. I'd love to be able to say something like that. Uh, but there was one very, very notable one, uh, you know, maybe maybe nothing even more notable than this. You're the first woman we mentioned in the introduction to win uh, a $1 million prize in a tournament. This was the... Uh, uh, the famous or the infamous, depending on how you look at it, 20 to, 2002 Party Poker Million. Um, it's very legendary. People talk about this tournament even today. It's 20 years later. Um, you know, it took place uh, on a cruise ship. Um, what can you sort of tell us, just to, you know, for those who weren't around and following poker back then, uh, the premise of this tournament and what you remember about it that was perhaps unique? Well, I, uh, Mark Sexton was with Party Poker, and he was going around telling everybody, this is going to be the greatest tournament. you got to go in this tournament and stuff like that. And, you know, it was obviously a new concept that he that he was very involved in, in promoting and, and, and developing where, you know, oh, for $8 or $10, $20, whatever it was online, you could play this, you know, you know, on, you know, qualify online and wind up in this tournament where you could win a million dollars for first place mm -hmm. for just playing, uh, you know, very inexpensively online. And, you know, and, uh, and it, you know, it. Uh, people, you know, every everybody. He said everyone's going to want to be able to play this and this and that, and and he was right. A lot of people went online for the first time and played poker online and and tried to qualify for it. And it was uh, it was a whole different concept. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the million dollars for first was like you know 
uh, it was crazy to think that it was a million dollars for first. Uh, yeah. But it's funny because I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't that excited about it at first. And I was like, <laughs> oh, cruise ship and all this stuff. You know, he was all excited. You know, he actually had to convince me to go. He kept telling me, oh, it's going to be the greatest and all this stuff. And my friend Tom McAvoy was saying, oh, you got to go. And, you know, they actually had to kind of twist my arm to go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, you know, and it was. It was a lot of amateurs and then a bunch of pros, you know. So it was an interesting mix. You know, a lot of people had won. I had won their seat online for $8 or $10, whatever it was. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then there was the other people that were buying it for 8000 Yep. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was it was pretty cool. And I mean, from the very at the time, I was playing more no limit actually than limit even. And uh, you know, I went in there with the mindset, okay, well, you have to go for first in this one. You know, this is right. not a tournament that you play to survive. So I did play a different style than you know. I mean, I was I'm not saying I was always a pass. I'm not a passive player, you know. But I decided to play even more aggressively than what I normally would, and just kind of go for it, you know. And um, right. It was interesting, yeah. So the second place finisher uh, named Burge Kacharian. Thank you very much, Hendon Mob. But we, what would we do without you guys? Uh, the second place finisher got just over ninety three thousand dollars. And again, reminder: the the big sell, the big marketing point of this tournament, one million dollars to first. And you know, obviously, there's a guarantee. You got to stand by the guarantees, uh, and uh, you know that's not always easy to do. But you know. Do you remember? I mean, I, I think this I mean, obviously gigantic overlay, uh, you know, did uh, you know, I think there were like 130, 160 player, players all together uh, in this tournament, uh, which is not a lot, uh, even if, you know, it's very pro heavy. Uh, so, you know, interesting minefield, as you said, you know, some recreational just happened to be on the cruise. So when they're way in and, and some who bought in directly, um, was this sort of a major topic of conversation among the players of like, what is going on with this discrepancy of a million for first and, you know, less than six figures for second? Uh, well, because they've guaranteed a million for first, they didn't really have it in the prize pool. They couldn't pay out, you know, a standard kind of payout system right. and have a million dollars for first. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was kind of known that it was going to be likely to be very top heavy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you knew that going in. And uh, some of the pros, I mean, some of the people that knew each other and stuff like that would trade small pieces and stuff like that mm -hmm. because of the fact that it was so top heavy. And I actually did make a couple trades myself with some of the, the people that, were, that I knew that were playing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when we got to the final table, there was talk of a deal because, you know, because the set was such big discrepancies in the money. Right. And uh, Mel Judah actually had the shortest stack. And, you know, they looked at the ICM. And he said, you know what? It's not worth it for me to make a deal because, you know, I'm a short stack. I'm not going to get that much more right. and I can win a million dollars if I win <laughs> it. So I'm not going to do a deal. Uh, but then he got knocked out right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a deal came up. A mention of a deal came up again. And we did divide up a little bit of the money at that time to guarantee okay. to, 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 to flatten it out a little bit. Uh, not a lot, but we did flatten it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then when we got down to forehanded, it came up again. Um and uh, Phil Helmuth was like, well, you know, I'm the best player in the world. I, if you're going to do a deal, I should get the most money and this and that, you know, and, you know, I, you know, I want a premium kind of thing. And I was the chip leader at the time. I was like, nope, I'm not, right. you know, I was like, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to, why, why should you get more money and this and that? But then Burge, actually, the, the guy that wound up coming in second, uh -huh. uh, he was like, no, I want to do a deal. You right. know, he's like, you know, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, he's like, well, what if it comes out of my share, you know? So sure. he actually... Uh, he actually said, said to Phil, you know, I'll give up some of, some of my equity or whatever, you know, to you in order to, to make a deal. So we did make, uh, we did distribute some, some more money at that time to uh -huh. even out a little bit more. Interesting. Uh, and we're still, we're still playing for a fair amount. And actually it's funny because Burge was the one that kept beating Phil every hand. He, you know, <laughs> Phil was trying to run over this guy and he was just holding over him and every hand, you know, Phil was like, Oh, how do I lose this guy? How do I lose this guy? You know, I mean, just, he was just, you know, just beating him like, you know, like, you know, I mean, just, you know, just winning every hand from him. Wow. And Phil was getting frustrated. And I mean, I don't think I won that many hands from Hal Neuf, but Burge was, was beating him every hand, you know, and then, um, and then I did pick up some big hands and win a few big pots. And, huh. and I tried to bluff Chris Ferguson in one hand that when we were five handed yeah. and I caught on the river and I caught on the river, you know, and that was a significant pot for me. Uh, I think I had like, you know, two overcard, maybe I had a gut shot with overcards and everything and he didn't fold, but then I made what I needed to on the river and Phil, I was like, Oh, that's so unfair. How did this happen? You know? <laughs> It's, it's so incredible and, uh, to hear to hear your perspective. <laughs> you know, this is you know twenty years ago before you know poker media was so developed that you had live reporting. It's literally on a cruise ship. 
Uh, you know, so it's it's so interesting to hear, you know, from, from you know your your journey in there, and especially the you know that these final table notes. Yes, Phil, you know Phil Helmuth, Chris Ferguson, you had uh, you know legend uh, Kenny Skyhawk, Clayton were at that final table. Mel Judah, um, interesting little trivia point, you know, folks. You look at uh, you look up in Hendon Mob, uh, you know, for this Party Poker Million 2022. We're talking about Burge Kacharian. It was his first and last ever live tournament score. You know, it's almost like, oh, like you say, he's holding over Phil Helmuth. Helmuth ended up finishing third. Like, I'm good. I don't need to play anything, anything, anything else. Yeah. Very, very I mean, he, he obviously qualified online and, uh-huh. you know, and just uh, was there, you know, wasn't obvious, you know, wasn't obviously a professional poker player and just went for the fun of it and got really lucky and decided, you know, that wasn't enough for him. Which is surprising that he never played again or never showed up again. Uh, you know, it is a little, you know, you'd think that after having that kind of run, Right. That he'd, you know, right. come back at some point and play something, you know, or maybe, maybe he didn't, didn't win. Who knows? But unbelievable. Uh, maybe he took it and invested it, it in memorable. Apple or something. <laughs> it was a very memorable final table. Obviously, it was the first one they filmed for the Travel Channel with Steve mm-hmm. Lipscomb. And I remember at the final table, they, they put us all in this huge ballroom, you know, and, you know, they had us at the final table and Mike Sexton was doing the commentary. Mm-hmm. And I remember he was commenting on the hands, you know, as they were in progress, you know. And that was a little unusual because we could hear what he was saying. Oh, well, you could wait, literally wait. hear it. Wow. Yeah, he wasn't behind the booth. He was just actually at the final <laughs> table announcing the hand. And I, I remember when I was when we were three handed, you know, he was he was like, Oh, Kathy re raised. I don't think she's re raised all, you know, off the final table. You know, like he was making these comments that maybe, you know, I mean, if the people were if the players weren't already aware of it, he was making them aware of it, you know. So that was kind of so funny, funny that he was kind of doing a a, a a live analysis right in front of us of our game and stuff. Right, uh, I guess. I guess on the high really seas, there's no uh, gaming commission or something like that. For <laughs> he was being dramatic about it, but it's funny because yeah, we could hear him. It wasn't like he was doing it like the, you know these days. You know, I mean, when WPT came on, you couldn't hear him while you were playing. You know, after, you know, it was you know it was made for TV, and they did the you know either afterwards or behind the scenes. Sure. So, sure. but wow. uh, yeah, that was different. Unbelievable. Um, when we talk about uh, you know your your million dollar score, obviously you've got uh, your WSOP bracelets and the uh, 2004 Limit Hold'em shootout of WSOP over there. You know when you look at those two sorts of things, or maybe is there something else you know on your long list of accolades, something that sort of stands out to you as your proudest moment? Um, well, I don't know about proudest moment, but you know, the WPTs were actually very good for me. They were very slow structured tournaments, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and there was a lot of play, you know, a lot of the WSOP events, even, you know, even, you know, all, all the years, you know, are, are a little bit faster, you know, they're kind of, you know, especially at one point, you know, you don't really have uh, a lot of play and you have to get pretty lucky, you know, at one point the, the, the blinds jump, you know, jump to be pretty significant, no matter what your stack is. And, uh, you know, then you have to run well. And the WPTs always had a real slow structure. So the fact that, uh, you know, so I would, you know, I, I had a lot of success for the WPTs and playing that kind of structure where you had lots of play and lots of time. And, um, you know, obviously those were very big events and very successful events for me. And then they had the 10K pot limit hold'em in 2008. That was a very, uh, a lot of really good players in that one. In fact, the final table of that one had uh, Mike Sexton, uh, Nanad Medich, uh, Patrick Antonius, um, uh, uh, meet, uh, you know, a lot of successful online players. Mm-hmm. So that was a very f- tough final table. And, uh, to get there on that one was, you know, that was a very tough field. It was a small field, you know, and, um, so that, that was, uh, you know, that, that one was probably one of the, one of the ones that, uh, was, was a big accomplishment to make it in that one. Um, and then the, the Bay 101, I wound up finishing second to Steve Brecker. And mm-hmm. that one, I was, uh, at the final table, I was, I was, I was running pretty well. And then I had a, a hand where I had ace king versus ace queen, and it came a king on the flop, king rag, rag you know, and it looked like I was, you know, if I had won that pot, I would have eighty percent of the chips in play three handed, mm-hmm. and it wound up. I was like, okay, you know, I really thought you know, that was it, and then he wound up catching uh, runner runner and made a straight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, um, so that, uh, <laughs> that one was very significant. Yeah. Uh, and th- but I mean, that was a great tournament, and that was a huge payday for me. Um, you know, so all the WPT final tables. Uh, were very significant and very, you know, very, uh, you know, very big money and accomplishment. Uh, and WSOP obviously is, is 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 just as prestigious, or you know, but it's it's the faster tournaments and you have to run better. You know, I mean, no matter how well you play, you're gonna have to run reasonably well. You know, you can't get unlucky too many times and survive. Sure. Uh, 
you know, you know, so. Sure. Well, WPT is uh, celebrating their 20th anniversary this year. They've got a big end of year tournament, the WPT World Championship taking place uh, at the win uh, this December. Are you uh, planning on uh, winning your way in via satellite, perhaps, or will, can we expect to see you there? Yeah, I'm planning on playing it. I probably will play a couple satellites. Uh, I know they're having some satellites. They have a bunch of series before that one where they have some satellites. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I'll probably play a satellite or two at least. Um, and yeah, that should be a good one. I actually don't like uh, the fact that uh, they, they allow so many re-entries these days. Mm. Like, you know, where, you know, you can re-enter unlimited times and even on day two, you can re-enter. I'm not sure if the wind does that, but I know the Bellagio does that. Right. And I mean, I think it's nice to be able to, if you get knocked out, to be able to, to, to keep playing. Yeah. Uh, but it does kind of have, uh, make it much tougher and a lot more pros and a lot more, you know, less amateurs and kind of does change the dynamic of the tournament a lot. Right. You know, in the old right. days, there was no re-entries, no rebuys. So you just kind of had to play pretty solid. But you know, I played a WPT with Daniel Negreanu at the uh, at the Bellagio and he was shoving blind. You know, he was just <laughs> like, OK, you know, I'm either gonna, I'm going to get a lot of chips or, you know, one way or the other, I'm going to get a lot of chips, you know. And, uh, you know. Uh, a lot of the pros kind of had that mindset. Hey, I can just gamble it up and really, you know, and really, you know, just try to get a lot of chips. And that does make it a lot tougher for the average player to be competitive and to, and to, you know. So sure. I kind of liked it back in the old days a little bit better. Although, you know, I like to be able to, I like the option of being able to re-enter. But when you're talking about a ten thousand dollar tournament or a fifteen thousand dollar tournament, you know, most of the average players are not going to be re-entering. Uh, it makes it much tougher, you know, for for those for 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 a lot of people to have, to have a chance. A real good chance of making it to the end. Sure, and I do believe the re-entry was invented or, or proposed, you know, brought into poker world by Matt Savage. And Matt Savage, you know, uh, no, does listen to all the poker podcasts, and I know he listens to this one. He was episode number fifty-one. He was our interviewee, our guest. Matt's listening, uh, and uh, you know, as the uh, executive tour director of the World Poker Tour, uh, always looking to to tweak things, make things you know better, change. So I'm sure he's always paying attention. Uh, he always has uh, you know the the, the players' uh, best interests in mind. So. Uh, it's good you voice that. It's important. Uh, I think he's aware of it as well. Uh, so, you know, but sometimes you know, once you let the cat out of the bag, uh, it's a little bit difficult to sort of, you know, bring it back in, you know, if players uh, in general seem to like it. Because, you know, the opposite, obviously the, the flip side of that is true. Uh, you know, if Daniel's going for broke or whatever it is, well, at least there's that much more money in the prize pool uh, to potentially win. So there's obviously, uh, you know, two yeah, there's sides pros and cons. I mean, if, yeah. you know, it, it makes it easier to want to travel to a tournament circuit. As sure. you know, you can re enter. You know, if, if you're going to travel someplace, you want to go all the way there and be at the first hand and be like, oh, what? Well, you know, and that's, you know, so there, you know, I can, you know, so I, I like, sometimes I like the option of the re enter also. Sure. Uh, but the unlimited re entries uh, does change the dynamic and does make it tougher uh, for the average player to be, you know, so I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to know, you know, I'm not sure what the solution is. I mean, some of these sites, you know, have one re entry or something like that. Maybe that's a reasonable, you know, that's, that might be, you know, and I think I think more of the average players would be more comfortable playing it with no re-entries, only one re-entry, because they feel like I have a better chance sure. than somebody that can just keep re-entering over and over again. Especially, you know, there's obviously a lot of super deep pocket pros that are you know that are successful that do make it, uh, you know, that, that will that will you know re-enter ten times if they have to and. You know, so For sure. Well, I, I, can, I can speak to that and confirm as an average player that that would make me feel comfortable. Unfortunately, I'm just about $10,000 short of the buy-in for this one. So I, I will not be competing, <laughs> but I do hope to be there, uh, perhaps covering it. Uh, just two more questions from me before we get into the uh, wonderful community questions. I promised you all, uh, you know, Kathy had mentioned uh, the Gold Coast. You know, I've stayed there a number of times. Um, if you've ever stayed there, at least, uh, you know, in, in, in recent years, you will notice that this, the Gold Coast, this is you know, basically right across the street from the Rio, uh, and they do not have a poker room, but obviously they used to, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, the event that you cashed in over there, you know, you look over, I looked at this, I couldn't believe it. it's a $100 Omaha high-low tournament, it had 500 players, okay, at the Gold Coast, so how does that happen? And secondly, what was poker like at the Gold Coast for those of us who never had the privilege of doing of playing there? Yeah, I mean, I guess at the time there was not a lot of poker tournaments, and you know, and it was in Vegas, and it was during the summer, and a lot of the pros would play it. I mean, you would see WSOP champions, you know, playing these hundred dollar tournaments. You know, I mean, <laughs> Mike Sexton, Tom McAvoy, you know, wow. John Benetti, all you know, all these guys that uh, you know were WSOP, you know, players would be playing this tournament at the Gold Coast. 
uh, yeah, it was a cheap buy with huge fields. And uh, yeah, you got a huge mix of both amateurs, regular people, you know, uh, people just playing for fun and people that were very successful. Wow. So, uh, and that was my first uh, foray in tournaments. And yeah, I had a great first week. And I think that if I hadn't had that first week, I might not have become a tournament player. You know, I might not have even played tournaments. Really? Because, wow. Again, yeah, I mean, I was playing cash games and it didn't occur to me to go to the tournament. And again, my friends kind of convinced me to go like, oh, you should try it. And I was thinking, you know, even when I was in the cash game the day before the, the first event, and I was like, oh, I can, you know, this is a fun cash game. I can just do this. You know, why go play that tournament? And they're like, no, you should go play. You know, it's 100 bucks, 200 bucks, you know, go for it. Take it to, you know, and I was, you know, and it worked out. And I was hmm. glad I did. <laughs> Unbelievable. But, uh, yeah. and, and the Gold Coast, what was that like? I mean, again, it's still around today. Uh, but what was it like playing poker there? What was the poker room like? It was, up, it was upstairs in the ballroom. So uh-huh, a huge, okay. huge ballroom with tons and tons of tables. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, that was my first experience playing tournaments. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, I, I went there to try to win, you know, but I was, you know, it was, it was fun, you know, mm. uh, just a lot of different people there. I remember oh. that was the first time I played with Linda Johnson in the $100 Omaha Ada huh. Better Tournament. I remember playing with her. And, uh, yeah, I also remember seeing, I remember seeing Tom McAvoy, Mansoor, Mont Luby, Mike Sexton, uh, all these, you know, all these, you know, I really didn't know too much about any of these players. You know, it was my, you know, I just kind of come on the scene. Right. Uh, but yeah, then, you know, when I realized, oh, you know, these guys are WSRP champions and stuff right. and they're playing a hundred dollar tournament, you know, I was like, wow. You know? That's unbelievable. Cause you know, you think these days, anyone, you know, folks out there, uh, you know, listening in the cards chat community, you know, myself included, sure. We'll go ahead and play a hundred dollar Omaha high low tournament at one of the dailies. You know, maybe at the Orleans, they still have stuff like that you're probably not going to find a field stocked full of pros. Uh, so like, lest you think, oh, if I was playing back then 20, 25 years ago, I would have wiped the floor. Uh-uh. You know, that's not, not, not likely. It was a tough field for a hundred dollar event. Um, and I could also say like, you know, other places, speaking of places that don't exist anymore, that the, the Amarillo Slim Super Bowl of poker, the Four Queens Poker Classic, these are, you know, places where you've notched some results in your career as well. Uh, you know, there's, Casinos that are no longer in existence in, in in Las Vegas and Southern California. Um, what what do you remember about those days, sort of traveling and and you know th- those are still like you know you, you hear the names of those events and it's kind of like legendary. Oh, that used to be it. Was it a similar vibe to you know the Binions or the World Series, or was it something else? Uh, you know that that we weren't all privy to. Um, it was a little bit different. I remember they had the when they had the Legends of Poker series, they had a, a ranking. And, uh, hmm. you know, you wanted to, you know, so you were trying to get up the leaderboard and I forget exactly what the prizes were, but there was some, some different prizes and stuff like that for finishing high up the rankings. So they had all these different tournaments and some of the games I was not that familiar with, but I wound up playing every game because I was on the leaderboard for the ranking list. So I was playing, I was playing low ball and I was playing pineapple or whatever game they had, you know, and some of those games I played a little bit in some of the home games in Colorado, mm-hmm. but some of them I hadn't really played that much, um, so, yeah, it was kind of fun to get to play all the different games. I remember playing Seven Card Stud and Seven Card Stud Ada Better. And those games I really didn't play a lot of, uh, especially at that time. And uh, I wound up heads up with David Pham and Seven Card Stud. And he wound <laughs> up winning. And he's like, oh, Cal, he doesn't play much stud. I never saw a stud tournament before. And then I got heads up in the Seven Card Stud Ada Better with John Cernudo. And uh-huh. it was the same thing. I didn't know you played Ada Better Stud, you know? So it was kind of a... Uh, it was a little different, you know, it was, it was, it was fun because I might not have been playing those games on a regular basis, especially at that time, you know, but because they had the leaderboard and the, you know, extra incentive, right. you know, uh, encourage you to play a lot more tournaments and play every game. Very cool. So that was fun. I love that you can, you know, you can, uh, you know, casually reference, you know, Miami John, John, the dragon family. Very, very cool. Always so cool to hear. Again, I'm just a, a poker fan at heart and, and, and very nostalgic for those old days. I never got to, to see it. Very, very cool to hear about that. Um, and I got to insert one last question. We always ask our guests here on the Cards Chat podcast, uh, just from myself, who, you know, you, you mentioned all these legendary names, you know, you know, Mike Sexton, Linda Johnson, you know, all, all these you know, amazing legends of poker. Is there someone or, or maybe a couple of people you could point to over the years as the friendliest poker player that you ever had the chance of competing against? Wow, that's a tough one. Mm. Uh, friendliest poker player. Um, hmm. I'd probably have to think about it a little bit. I mean... Well, as you think, we'll give you the time chip. And I'll just say the reason we asked that question, uh, you know, we do bill ourselves here on Cards Chat as the friendliest poker podcast in town. So that's that's sort of where the question emanates from. 
Yeah, I played with a lot of friendly players. I mean, a lot of them are pretty serious. But I mean, somebody that always came across as very friendly was Daniel. You know, mm. he's always chatting you up and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I know this this summer at the WSOP, he might have lost uh, some of his friendliness uh, <laughs> persona. <laughs> he ran pretty poorly, to be to be fair. Sure. Uh, but in general, he's one that's always talking to players and you know having conversations and being friendly and stuff like that. Uh, you know, he's not always as friendly away from the table, but he's always been somebody that's been, you know, kind of liking to get to know you and asking questions and stuff at the table. So, um, yeah, oh, sounds he's cool. definitely with. Very cool. All right. Well, now we will turn. Uh, it's important in poker to change gears. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to turn to the segment of the show where we ask you guys our cards chat community to see what questions you wanted to ask our guests. And of course, we do have a dedicated thread on the Cards Chat forums for this. So as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. Uh, for a change, uh, we're going to start off with Acid Burn FX. Always tends to ask some interesting, somewhat off-the-wall questions, but, you know, he's a little bit more tame uh, this time around. So thank you very much, Acid Burn FX, for sending these in. Um, Kathy, Acid Burn FX wants to know... Um, what is the craziest thing you've ever done and would you do it again and why? <laughs> the craziest thing I've ever done. I don't know. It could um, be limited to the poker sphere or not. It's up to you. <laughs> well, I guess I can think of two things that were slightly crazy. Uh, one is uh, I was at a poker table with uh, Mike Lang, who was drunk and smoking. Mm. And he was blowing smoke right in my face. Ooh. And without really thinking about it too much. I slapped him because he was, I, I, it started off as like a, a light slap, kind of like just moving his face away from mine uh -huh. uh, because he was smoking in it, you know, and it kind of, you know, at first, you know, but he was drunk and he wound up taking a big drag of a cigarette and blowing it right in my face. Oh. And then at that point, without even thinking about it, I just slapped him across the face and he yeah. almost slugged me. Oh God. He almost slugged me. <laughs> so I didn't realize how dangerous that was. I was just sort of trying to defend myself. That was sure. a long time ago. But that was, wow. uh, cool. You know, that that was not planned or thought, and there was no thought to that. It was just going to happen. <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I remember one time I was uh, one of my way to catch a train, and the train started pulling out, and I did like uh, an Indiana Jones thing, you know, like, oh, like, wow. like in the movies. I started running after the train and jump on. And the guy was like, you can't do that. I'm like, what, what do you do? I didn't do anything. That's He's amazing. like, you can't run on a jump. You can't jump on a running train. I was like, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love I, that's why we love Acid Burn FX questions. They're a little, you know, out there, but they they lead to some great stories. Those were a couple of great ones. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. All right, we got uh, one more from Acid Burn FX. Uh, if you could dedicate your life to solving one problem, what problem would that be, and why? Wow. Uh, I mean, you know, the biggest problem I, I see is, uh, you know, world hunger. You know, there's a lot mm. of people that are really going hungry these days and it's crazy. I mean, we live in, you know, we live in a world where there's so much food and so much food production and so many people are so rich. And, you know, it doesn't make sense to me that people, there are people all over the world uh, are actually starving and don't have enough food. Mm. Uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of problems in the world, but uh, it seems like that would be something that, that should be able to be solved. Yeah. You know, so people in this country and other countries uh, don't go hungry. That just is insane. Yeah, well, definitely a, a sadly worthy cause. But, uh, you know, yeah, very, very, very good answer, obviously. Yeah, hopefully this uh, that, that can improve. Good, good question. Great answer. Um, Chica Bonita, thank you very much. You sent a number of questions. We're just going to pick one of yours. But thank you very much for sending this one in. Uh, Chica Bonita wants to know, Kathy, do you have a poker nemesis among professional players who you always want to beat more than others or who always wants to beat you? Um, no, I can't think of a specific nemesis. There's been a few players over the years that were very abusive or very nasty mm. and, and very not extremely unpleasant to play with. Mm. And uh, I would rather not be at their table at all. Uh, you know, um, and yeah, you don't want them to beat you, obviously. And sure. you know, you, you want to see them gone, whether you beat them or somebody else beats them. Uh, but I mean, for the most part, people are usually pretty nice and polite at the table. But uh, over the years, I've certainly come across a few that were that were very much, uh, you know, out of line and, and unpleasant. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, those players 
uh, get eliminated as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a fair take for sure. Um, here's one from a name I've never seen before. Thank you very much. And almost uh, almost 100 episodes in, it's great to see uh, new members of the community uh, putting some questions for. So this is Nab Mom. Thank you very much for, for putting this question out there. Uh, Kathy, yeah, here's Nab Mom's question. First, thank you for being such an icon for the skills that women poker players bring to the game. Uh, over the course of your career, what do you think have been the biggest challenges to getting more women in the game? What has been resolved and what still needs to be tackled? Uh, early on, one of the biggest issues was smoking at the table. It was very unpleasant to have people smoking in your face. And, you know, uh, and so that I'm glad that got resolved quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that was certainly uh, something that made it uncomfortable. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the fact that online poker came and, and women could, could start playing online and practice online and get familiar with the game without actually going and sitting in the live casino, uh, that probably did help a lot more women come into the game. Uh, you know, I, for some reason, you know, I guess if they never played before, that women might be a little bit more uncomfortable to come and sit at a game. You know, I guess it wasn't as common, especially back in the old days, for women to be playing poker games. You know, even right. nickel dime quarter with the family, it was more unusual. So uh, I guess the advent of online poker really and, and the training sites and the coaching and the, you know, all that kind of stuff really did bring more women into the game and make it more, uh, more, more accessible to a lot more women. Great. Very cool. Well, we've got uh, one last question asker. Uh, that's Crystals. Thank you very much for, for submitting these crystals. Always, uh, well, our dependable crystals. who can always send a few in. Um, got, uh, we'll do two questions from Crystals uh, just to sort of end off. Uh, Crystals wants to know, Kathy, what, if anything, needs to change in poker in the next five years to ensure its long-term success? Uh, that's that's not an easy one. Um, no, well, we saved the good, the best ones for last. <laughs> what has to change, uh, if anything? Well, I mean, I actually, I mean, I think that uh, the 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 GTO kind of stuff and all that stuff. I think it has brought more players into the game and the, mm. more players have studied and stuff like that. But at the same time, I think it makes it, uh, I, I think having that, that, that be the general mindset or feel like people feel like if they don't know it, uh, that they're, you know, they don't have a chance. They're not competitive. I think that's actually a bad thing. Mm. You know, I kind of, I, I think that people have to feel like they can come and be competitive and play the game, you know, you know, without having to study and do all that stuff. You know, I think that if they feel like they're not competitive, unless they, they know all this kind of new theory and new and all that studying and stuff like that. I think that's kind of inhibits a lot of people from getting into it and wanting to play, you know, back mm -hmm. in the good old days, you know, it was just, you know, we just went and played. We didn't have solvers. We didn't have charts. We didn't have all that stuff, sure. you know, just, you know, just, you know, just, you know, just went and played, you know, and, and that kind of made it, you know, more feel like a, more like a level playing field. I think maybe some of these people, some of these players today might feel like it's not a level playing field because, you know, uh, especially, you know, the ones that go around touting that, oh, if you don't know, you know, if you're not studying, you're not going to have a chance and stuff like that. So I think that could be a drawback, I, you know. Um, and I guess keeping the, you know, keeping a lot of the small tournaments and small buy-ins, you know, uh, is important. You know, I, I you know, they, people need to be able to have a, an introduction to poker and being right. able to start at a low level. You know, if there's only just big tournaments, uh, big buy-ins, then that would limit the growth of poker. So I think it, it would be kind of nice if there was more uh, beginner tournaments and, you know, and more, you know, more ladies events and more things like that. This made people feel comfortable starting out, you know, just, you know, just when you first start playing that you have to feel like you're competitive and comfortable and not feel like you're a big dog, you know, kind of thing. I like it. Uh, very, very insightful responses. And as I mentioned, obviously Matt Savage, but a whole bunch of people listen to this podcast. So it's great to hear from one of the legends of the game on that front. And, you know, they, they do, they do pay attention and, and perhaps uh, because of, you know, coming out and saying things like that, uh, they will go ahead and, and, and ensure that, you know, the, the proper changes are made or more lady event, ladies event happens or at the lower buy-in points, it's uh Good for you to say that. So thank you. Yeah, um, we mentioned that before that, that all the rebuys and the you know stuff like yeah. that probably discourages the average player. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, our last question uh, again, thank you very much, Crystals, for submitting it. Kathy, Crystals wants to know what goal do you still have to as far as achievements in your poker career? Well, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm still. I'm still competing at WSOP and some WPT events. And uh, 
obviously I would still like to uh, to win uh, bracelets and WPT titles. So mm-hmm. uh, and as long as I'm competing, obviously I would like uh, I'd like to uh, to win. And so to, you know, more, just continue to be successful. But yeah, it'd be nice to get another bracelet and uh, a WPT uh, title. You know, yeah. Title, yeah. Cool. Oh, very, very fair. <laughs> very straightforward. And, and it makes a lot of sense. You know, you don't play and sit down at the table in the first place if you don't want to win. So, um, guys, thank you so much for sending in your questions for Kathy Liebert. And again, uh, a friendly reminder to all of you out there in the Cards Chat community, we'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guest in the dedicated thread on the forums. Please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Uh, Kathy, again, this has been a, a wonderful and lovely conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Before we, before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to share with the Cards Chat community? Uh, well, thank you for having me and I uh, appreciate it. And yeah, I, I hope that more women and more people in general uh, continue to play and enjoy the game and uh, ho- hopefully uh, more, more and more success down the road for for the for the amateurs as well as the GTO, I mean, you know, hopefully we're, they they were more competitive than than they think, you know, against yeah. the GTO type P players. Yeah, it's <laughs> always always good to get those those stories that hey, if so and so can do it, we can do it too. That's definitely a good note on, on which to end. Kathy, again, thank you so much. Thank you all for tuning in once again to another episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. Cards Chat the friendliest poker podcast in town from the world's number one poker community.